Hi, bookish besties. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you were already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. Today, we are here to talk about books I disliked by authors I love. <music> Within the past several months, I have been highly anticipating some releases from authors that I've really, really enjoyed in the past, only to have their books be severely disappointing. And so that's what actually inspired me to do this video. So I have a handful of books here that I want to talk about today, and we are just going to go ahead and jump right in. The very first one that I want to quickly mention is Heartbones by Colleen Hoover. Y'all know how I feel about Colleen Hoover. She's one of my favorite authors of all time. She very rarely steers me wrong. Even if I'm reading a book that I don't necessarily love, I still think it's an overall enjoyable and strong reading experience, but that wasn't the case with this. And my main complaint about this is that it was entirely too juvenile I think for what it was trying to accomplish. Now I will say that the main characters in this are only about like 19 so it is very much new adult coming out of young adult. So this follows our main character Bea and literally in the very first couple of pages of this book she walks into her trailer to find her mom dead of an overdose. So it's a very harrowing start to the story and then she ends up having to go live with her dad who she's not necessarily estranged from but she's not really close with either. She's going into this very unfamiliar situation but she really has nowhere else to go no one else to turn to so she's stuck. So you're following her as she's going there. She's getting to know her stepsister. They're building a pretty strong friendship. And you're also following her as she's meeting a boy that also lives in the area and their growing relationship. And I remember there were a couple of main problems that I had with this book. First of all, Samson, the love interest in this story, would not answer literally any questions that Bea asked him. He kept so many secrets from her. Like she would deliberately ask him direct questions and he would not answer. He would say something big, or if I remember correctly, he would say that he would answer them at a specific point in time. But yet she was answering all of his questions, spilling her deepest, darkest secrets to him. And she wasn't getting anything in return yet after three or four weeks of being with Samson and hanging out with him and like dating and becoming romantically involved she was basically willing to give up her whole life for him because essentially it comes out some things that he's done in his past and he actually gets into legal trouble and she's willing to like put everything on hold for him like not go to college or anything just to wait for him and try to help him out of a situation. I mean we as readers know that he's a genuinely good guy but it sounded very very unrealistic because this was a very short book y'all. This did not take place over a long period of time. They really only knew each other for a handful of weeks and then all of a sudden this is coming to a head you're finding out some of the secrets that Samson has been hiding and she's just willing to put everything on hold for him. And what I really hated about this was the overt angst. Colleen Hoover is typically a very good master of angst. Like she's really good about making you feel the angst in the story. But what this was, was a lot of tell and no show. It is about two teenagers who are self-proclaimed damaged and sad. They continuously talk about how damaged and sad they are and they are drawn to the damage and the sadness in each other. This is just so overdone. I didn't really care about it at all. I didn't connect with their relationship. Like I said, it felt very young. It felt very very juvenile. I couldn't get behind Bea's willingness to drop everything for this guy when he obviously was lying to her and keeping secrets from her and getting into so much trouble. And I don't know, there was just something about the story that really, really, really didn't work for me. And it was a big disappointment. This is pretty much the only Colleen Hoover that I have rated below a three stars. This got a 2.5 star rating from me. This one did not work for me. Next, I have Pieces of Her by Karen Slaughter. I absolutely adore Karen Slaughter. She is probably one of my favorite thriller suspense authors of all time. She is incredibly dark and gruesome with her character. She is gritty and I just love her dark and disturbed mind. But this one was absolutely atrocious and the primary reason why it was atrocious was because of our main character Andrea Oliver. So this book starts with Andrea Oliver on her 30th birthday going to meet her mother for a lunch. Now Andrea is kind of a little bit lost. She's been working as a police dispatcher for a while. That's not really what she wants to do. Her mother is always pressuring her to kind of figure out her life and while they are at this lunch some guy comes in with a gun and starts shooting the place up and her mother immediately takes action and she takes down the gunman. Now of course Andrea Oliver is completely surprised by this. She's never seen her mother do anything like this before and nothing in her mother's past supposedly indicates her ability to do anything like this. But of course you're finding out that her mother has kept a lot of secrets and this follows Andrea Oliver as she's trying to uncover those secrets and she's kind of on the run. She's sent on the run because she's now going to be in danger because of what is coming out about her mother. Ultimately this sounds like it's going to be amazing. You know you have this mystery in the present as Andrea is on the run and she's trying to figure out what the secrets are her mother is hiding. She has no idea what is happening and I loved that right and then you're also getting the past perspective of her mother when she was young and all of the stuff that she got into to, to lead her to where she is today. But ultimately, unfortunately, I found Andrea Oliver to be one of the most frustrating characters in a book I have ever read in my entire life. I was so viscerally frustrated by her. I was like gesticulating while I was reading because she was completely, totally useless. In any situation when there was any danger, any confusion, any confrontation, she would just stop 
stop and be completely, utterly unable to do absolutely anything. There were a couple of moments in here where her mother had to swoop in and save the day because Andrea just like froze. Like she couldn't believe what was happening and she lost all ability to speak or communicate. It was just visceral within me how much I hated her as a character. I do also want to say that I didn't love the past perspective in this. I did really enjoy Andrea's present perspective for the most part, except for her. Like I enjoyed what she was going through in the present perspective and I didn't like the past perspective. There was just something really disconnected about it for me. I didn't really like the way that it was put together. I didn't really feel connected or engaged with it at all. And this was another one that I had a hard time really like suspending my disbelief on. So ultimately like nothing about this story worked for me. I gave it a two, I think a 2.5 stars. And that is absolutely unheard of for me with a Karen Slaughter. Now I will say that there is a sequel that's come out to it and it follows Andrea Oliver three years after the events in this book. And she has some incredible character development. She's a completely different person. And I highly recommend that one, which is called Girl Forgotten, I believe. And I enjoyed that one immensely. It was leagues above this one. So I would recommend just skipping this one and go to Girl Forgotten because this was an absolute waste of time. So this was a huge disappointment for me when it came to Karen Slaughter. And of course, I also have to touch upon The Last Word by Taylor Adams. No Exit by Taylor Adams is probably one of my favorite thrillers of all time. Just the atmospheric and chilling nature of that story has stuck with me ever since I read it. It was one of the most immersive thrillers that I have ever read. And so naturally, when I heard that he was coming out with a new story, it became my most anticipated release. And this let me down so, so, so profoundly. So this follows our main character, Emma Carpenter, and she's kind of reeling from a recent tragedy. And so she goes to this isolated Pacific Northwest Island where she's going to be out there on her own and she is going to be house sitting while she's out there. It is just her and her golden retriever Laika and that's the way that she wants it. She doesn't want to talk to anybody. She doesn't want to have any communication with anybody. And for the most part, that is the case, except for a neighbor like a mile or so away named Deke. And Emma basically spends her days reading and she's looking for really any ebook bargain she can find. And one day she finds and reads this horror novel, which is like the worst thing that she's ever read in her entire life. And so she leaves a one star review for this book and she starts to find herself being harassed by the author of this story. And soon she finds that near her, some very sinister things start to happen, like her motion activated lights keep going off. And she's essentially convinced that the horror author is now coming to take his revenge on the one star review. And it goes from there. I want to read a line from my Goodreads review because I think it sums up my thoughts nicely. It says, if I had to sum up my thoughts on this, I would say, this is Taylor Adams includes everything in the story you don't believe will be included just because it would be entirely obvious. It's as though he feels like he is doing the subversive thing with certain actions in this book because they are so obvious we think they cannot possibly be included. And then they are. Now, I will say that this is all likely part of the satirical effect that this book is meant to have. It is extremely self-aware. Taylor Adams throws in here some of the typical thriller horror tropes that you often see. And then he proceeds to put the main characters in those same situations. You know, like in the classic horror movie, like why is that dumb bitch running up the stairs instead of running out the door, right? And so he's essentially making fun of himself and other horror thriller authors. But that's not what I was looking for when I was going into this story, right? I was actually looking for a legitimate suspense thriller. And what I got was just a farce because like I said, he throws absolutely everything into the story that you think cannot possibly be in the story because it is so damn obvious. And then he throws it in there. And I remember thinking that when I read the synopsis, I was thinking that this book was going to be more than what the synopsis was. And in some ways it might have been, but for the most part, it's almost exactly what the synopsis says it's going to be. So don't read the synopsis before you're going into this. You know what? There was just so many things that were wrong with the story. And this could have been a true survival story. Like there were some intense moments in here. And I think Taylor Adams had a lot of room to do a lot with the story, but he just didn't. The artistic choices that he chose to make in this story were so completely insane. And it really took me out of the story. It made me have a very hard time connecting with it. And ultimately it just made this a huge, huge, huge disappointment. Similarly, I had a lot of very high hopes going into Only If You're Lucky by Stacey Willingham. I really enjoyed Flicker in the Dark and absolutely loved all the dangerous things. And so I trusted Stacey Willingham, but I did go into this with a fair amount of trepidation and hesitation because I knew it was going to contain one of my least favorite tropes. And that is of like toxic female friendships, but I trusted Stacey Willingham. So I was going to go into it and I was going to give it a fair shot. And unfortunately this just did not work for me. I will say that typically Stacey Willingham features older characters in her stories. Like I believe A Flicker in the Dark and All the Dangerous Things contain women who are in like their late 20s, early 30s. But this legitimately follows 19, 20 year old college students. I know that this was kind of supposed to be her take on dark academia, but I don't think that she executed it very well at all. So in the story, we're following Margot. She's a new college freshman who is dealing with a fair bit of loss. She just lost her very best friend who she was supposed to go to college together. So now she's there in college on her own kind of moping and she basically wastes her freshman year. But come sophomore year, she finds herself drawn into the orbit of Lucy, who's this very enigmatic, charismatic person who everybody seems to be drawn to. She has her best friends and Margot is kind of thrust into them and all of their shenanigans. And she actually moves off campus with them and they're partying, they're drinking, they're living it up. And then one day Lucy goes missing. And so Margot and the two other best friends find themselves in the middle of this investigation. So there is technically a present and a past timeline, but really only like nine months to a year separate these timelines. So I really don't even think that there needed to be like a past and present timeline because they were so close together, it really didn't even do anything for the story. And of course, you're finding out all of the secrets that Lucy's 
been hiding, that Margot was uncovering, yada, yada, yada. It's all been done a thousand times before. I will say that ultimately by the end of it, I did like the way that Stacey Willingham wrapped up all of the different threads that she had been unraveling during the story. So like maybe the last 50 pages of this book was worth it, but ultimately I didn't feel like any of the other reading experience was worth it. For the most part, I would say the majority of the story was the characters really not doing much, drinking, partying, ultimately being pretty unlikable characters. You're definitely really not meant to like any of the characters in here. And that doesn't always bother me, but I need something redeemable about them. I need a reason to root for them. And I just really didn't have that in here. And I really couldn't understand why Margot, this seemingly smart girl, was so drawn in by Lucy. She was so enthralled by Lucy that she essentially threw all common sense out the window and just kind of went along with it. So ultimately, this was a huge disappointment. I really did not like this book. I think I gave it a 2.5 stars. I am going to give Stacey Willingham another shot, but if I do not like her next new release, I think I'm just going to chalk up the first two books as a fluke and move on with my life because this was a huge disappointment. Another huge, huge, huge disappointment for me was the last one by Will Dean. That was actually one that I read fairly recently and I talk a lot about it in one of my more recent vlogs. I adored Will Dean's first two releases. I really, really enjoyed them. And then I get to the last one and it was like it was written by a completely different author. It follows our main character who is on an Atlantic crossing with her boyfriend. She's going from the UK to America and one day she wakes up and her boyfriend is gone. Almost everybody is gone. And as she's searching the ship trying to figure out what's happening, she comes in contact with three other people. As they are trying to figure out what's going on, they come to find out that they are on some kind of reality television show that they didn't consent to. They have no idea what is happening. And it's ultimately survival because even though they're on the ship with kitchens and all this food, they are cut off from it. Like all of that stuff has been locked. So essentially they're trying to survive and you're supposed to root for them and all this stuff. So first and foremost, this book was entirely too long. It was like a 13 hour audiobook and it could easily have been like 11 or 10 hours and it would have been able to do what it did with a better pace to it and would have been able to keep me a little bit more engaged and interested. So first of all, the length of it was entirely, entirely too long. Also, I felt that the book was done a disservice by only being told from the perspective of our main character, right? She is in contact with three other characters, but you don't get their perspectives at all. It is only from her viewpoint. So there's really no character development or any way to really emotionally connect with the characters. And on top of that, she was doing the most obnoxious thing because apparently everything in her life has been influenced by her father and his gambling debts and the shame and embarrassment that he brought to her family. And so like everything she does now is trying to rid her family of the shame and embarrassment. So she's constantly hearkening back to her father and what he did. And it didn't fit with literally anything in the story. Like she would be on the ship and she would see something on the ship and randomly it would spark a memory of her and her father during this time of childhood. And I'm like, really? This makes absolutely no sense. It didn't really make me like this main character. And in fact, I really didn't like any of the characters. You just, like I said, don't get the chance to connect with them emotionally and so you don't root for them. You really don't care about what's going to happen to them. And then it kept getting a little bit more insane as more and more crazy things started to happen to these characters. This is another situation where I had a really hard time suspending my disbelief because this would like never ever happen. You would never be able to put somebody in this situation and cause them to survive without their knowledge that they are being put into this situation. So ultimately, again, the characters were flat. They were underdeveloped. They were fairly unlikable. I really didn't buy this whole situation that they put themselves in. Ultimately, I just think that this was incredibly poorly executed and I'm really, really disappointed. This is another situation where I will read one more book by Will Dean to see if I want to continue with him as an author. And if he doesn't do it for me, I'm going to move on. So this was a really huge disappointment. Another really big disappointment was Love on the Brain by Allie Hazelwood. Now I'm including this here because I absolutely loved the love hypothesis. That was probably one of the best fake dating books I've ever read in my entire life. I also adored Love Theoretically. I'm really hoping that this is just a one-off and that I will really adore any of her other adult romances that she comes out with. But this, this was really, really bad. It follows our main character, B, and she is a neuroscientist working with the National Institute of Health. And she's given her dream position to go out and work with NASA in Texas on a project related to like astronaut helmets. But she is very, very dismayed to find that she is going to be co-running this project with Levi, who is her college nemesis. He really doesn't know why, but Lee has always hated her and now she is paired with him and they're going to have to kind of work things out. And you can kind of see where it goes as they start to develop a relationship. They start being kind of like friends with benefits and it goes from there. One of my main complaints was that this was very, very heavy on social commentary. Now, some of the social commentary I might've even agreed with, but y'all know that I really don't like seeing social commentary pushed in somebody's face. Also, B was so incredibly comically and intensely dense. Like she kept saying how Levi hated her in grad school, yada, yada, yada. And even when she posed this to Levi, Levi was like, I never hated you in grad school. This is why you were getting those vibes off of me. But yet she was still saying that Lee hated her and she was refusing to see any other viewpoint. And it was very, very infuriating because she is such a smart woman. And for her to not actually see these things was very frustrating to me. There was also a small kind of you've got male side plot in here that really didn't do anything for the story. I love the you've got male trope. It is one of my favorite tropes to read in a story, but it was very much a side plot to this. And again, it didn't really do much for the story at all. It could have easily been left out with no repercussions. So I was a little bit frustrated by that because a trope that I loved was used just so haphazardly and it didn't need to be there. And then of 
of course, Allie Hazelwood makes this extremely predictable and uses miscommunication to serve her purposes, which I hate. I hate using miscommunication to serve purposes. So there were a lot of huge, huge, huge technical issues that I had with the story. So I did keep this because I do have all of her books in the book of the month edition. I don't really feel the need to get rid of it at this point, but honestly, this was just not good. And the last one I just want to briefly touch upon is The Huntress by Kate Quinn. Now, I want to make it clear that I did not hate this book in any way. It is still wonderfully written. Kate Quinn is a fantastic historical fiction author, and I will still probably continue to read anything that she writes because I've really enjoyed the other three novels that I've read by her. The reason why I'm including it in this video is purely because it was so disappointing from what I thought it was going to be. I expected this to become a new favorite Kate Quinn, and it is actually now my least favorite Kate Quinn. In post-war 1950, you're following Ian, who is a former journalist turned Nazi hunter. He's determined to make Nazis answer for their crimes because his brother was actually killed during World War II, but not by a Nazi. He was actually killed by a woman called the Huntress. So Ian is determined to also find this Huntress and take her down. It is like the mission of his life to find her. So you're following him in 1950 as he's doing that. During the war, you're also following a woman named Nina as she becomes like a fighter pilot for the Russian army during the war and everything that she goes through only to also come in contact with the Huntress with Ian's brother. So that is how those two kind of intersect. And then you're also following Jordan McBride and her father who was widowed brings home a mysterious woman. But Jordan is very, very suspicious of this woman. So you're following her, I believe it was like in 1945, 1946, like shortly after the war ends as she's investigating this woman and how it kind of disrupts their lives and she stops for a while. But then in 1950, she actually connects with Ian and his people as they are investigating the Huntress and what all that means and how those two intersect. So here's my main problem with this. This is a book called The Huntress, but you learn almost absolutely nothing about The Huntress. You know that The Huntress was apparently this evil woman during World War II who killed people. I don't think she was working for any type of army or anything like that. She just killed people for her own purposes, but you learn basically nothing about her. You don't get her character perspective at all in this. You really don't know anything about her history. You don't find out why she killed people. You don't learn absolutely anything about the titular character of this story. And I found that to be an incredible missed opportunity. I really don't feel like we needed Nina's past perspective at all in this story. And the reason why is because Nina is actually also prominently featured in the present perspective of this story, which again is 1950 with Ian. So we could have easily learned all about Nina's past and how she ended up coming into contact with the Huntress and Ian's brother. We could have found that all from her in the perspective with Ian. She did not need an entire perspective all to herself. In fact, hers was a perspective that I least enjoyed reading from. I was bored almost the entire time. There was only a very small part of the story when she was actually with the Huntress. The vast majority of the time we're in the story, we're following her as she's becoming this Russian fighter pilot and all that stuff. And I was like, why do we need to really know this? Why do we need to really dive deeply into this? We could have found out the important things of Nina's past from her interactions with Ian. And we could have had one perspective entirely dedicated to the Huntress. Now it could have been a very vague perspective. We didn't actually have to name the Huntress and her perspective. It could have just been from her first person perspective as what she's going through as she's going through the war and killing people. Like why on earth would you not have that in this book? It baffles me. It really, really does because for a book that's all about hunting the Huntress, you get very little of the Huntress. As I'm talking about this story, y'all, I give this a 3.5 stars, but I'm actually really, really frustrated by the direction that Kate Quinn decided to take this story. So I'm going to leave it at a 3.5, but honestly, I think it might be a three. I think I was that disappointed in the execution of this story that it might be worth a three stars, unfortunately. So this is another one. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are just some books from authors that I typically love that I really, really did not enjoy. Please comment down below some books that have disappointed you from authors that you typically love. Or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me a boat emoji in honor of the last one by Will Dean. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to connect with you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which you can always find linked down below along with any books that I'm going to talk about in a video. Until next time, y'all. Bye.